twelve disciples, and he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. At that time there came to Jesus a certain man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house, for he had only one daughter, about twelve years of age, and she lay dying. But as he went, the people thronged him, and a woman having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stanched, and Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how that she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. While he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not. Believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter, James, and John, and the father and mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her. But he said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out, and took her by the hand, and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again, and she rose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. Glory to the Lord. Glory to the Lord. Please be seated. Today's epistle to the unmercenaries is the great chapter out of 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 on love. What it does for us is reveals the primacy of love in all things. Truly love is the power behind all that is good, all that is of God, and all indeed that God himself is. And so it is that God places this discussion inside the context of the church, his body, and all the gifts that are listed there so that we might understand that as members in this body of Christ, this church that God has created by His Spirit, while there is diversity among us, there is to be unity, and that unity is found through the primacy of love and through us actuating the power of love in all that we do and indeed all that we think. May God bless us as we consider this great topic. He starts off the Apostle Paul at the end of chapter 12 and says, that we are indeed the body of Christ. You and I, those that are in Christ's church, are part of the mystical body of Christ. The church is that body. The physical church is that body. The Holy One Apostolic and Catholic Church is the body of Christ. And so it is that he continues and says that in this church, in this body of Christ, many have been set by God. As we saw in our epistle about Paul, he was set in the body to be an apostle. And he was gifted by God, through God's revelation even, to 
to be an apostle. He was set, he was picked, he was chosen, and he obeyed the command of God to become part of the body. So it is with you, and so it is with I. God has chosen us and called us to himself, and in obedience we come to him, and he gives us and places us and sets us in his body. But he sets us there so that there be a unity in this great diversity, each one different. Some are the salt, some are the healing balm. Some are the hand, some are the mind, some are the feet. Some are the hands of love, some are the heart, some are the mouth. All different, but called together to be in unity. But this unity is only impossible through love. He says that we should covet these gifts that God gives. And that's an interesting statement because, of course, we hear in the beginning of the Ten Commandments, coveting is a sin, right? But he says that we're supposed to cover, which means to covet, it means to desire the spiritual gifts. It's not a bad thing to desire a spiritual gift. He says right here, covet the best gifts. Desire to have spiritual gifts. Desire to be able to exercise them. But he says, I show unto you yet a more excellent way. Something that's above being gifted and having these talents that God gives us. Indeed, God says the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, which means they're outside of repentance. There's certain things that God's given to you there's gifts, if you will, that are God's for you, that are in you, whether you're converted, and whether you're a Christian, and whether you're part of the body or not. But to fully use those gifts, you need to be set in the body. It's there that the power of these gifts becomes manifest, and God's power begins to work through you for the profit of all in the body and without it. So he says it's okay to desire spiritual gifts, but there's something, there's a way he sets it apart from the idea of gifts and says there's a way that encompasses all the gifts, which is greater than the gifts, but yet it's still a gift. And that is this love, this more excellent way. Love unlocks everything. Every virtue is unlocked by, God, by God's love in us. Every good thing, every good quality in our character is unlocked by love. There's gifts, if you will, and then there's the gift. There's love above all through all and in all. Everything else comes only truly from love working through our gifts. Above all the gifts, above all the gifts that he lists, the preaching, the teaching, the healings, all of which God desires, above all those and required for all those to be fully exercised properly is love. And so he sets it forth for us in three different ways how without love, Everything becomes meaningless. Everything becomes hollow. Everything becomes empty. And it doesn't lead to the purpose that God would have us spend our time doing things that would lead to good. And so he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity or love, I have become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. That sound idea is the idea of a sound that passes through the night or passes through the day. And as soon as it's over, it's done. It leaves nothing behind. And in fact, it can be even annoying. If you hear something like a clanging cymbal all day long, it can be rather annoying. And so he says that it's like that, that even if I had a tongue to speak like an angel, like the angel Gabriel spoke, or like Michael spoke, if we could speak like an angel but we had no love, if it were possible to be like that, it would be like a tingling simple cymbal or a sounding gong. It would just be here and gone and leave nothing behind, nothing profitable. The gifts are great, but without love, they accomplish nothing lasting or profitable. They're just like that noise that lasts for but a moment, and then it's gone. And then he says a second thing. He says, though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could move mountains, but I have not love, not charity, he says, I am, I am nothing. We can be often deluded by the things that we think we've done. But I submit to you that the final account is not done yet until God makes the accounting. And he says it truly, we are nothing without love, without God's love going through us. Though we had the ability to prophesy, though we were clairvoyant, though we had all sorts of gifts of knowledge, and we could understand every single mystery and explain it all, we didn't have love behind it, it would be truly true of us that we are nothing. 
Not only that we accomplish nothing, but we are nothing. And lastly, he says, that though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned like a martyr, and have not charity, he says, it profits me nothing. We could make the greatest sacrifice of our time, our talents, our treasure, even our very life. But if we don't have love behind that, it doesn't profit us anything. How much work and sacrifice do we do in vain because there's no love behind it? It's a humbling thought, perhaps for our efforts that we've exerted in the past in the name of Christian charity. But where there was no love, there was some other motive, Though I sacrifice everything, he says, it doesn't profit me nothing. Though I impress everyone with my great knowledge, I am nothing. And though I speak like an angel, I am nothing, I have nothing. I'm just like a tinkling brass or a sounding cymbal in the night. I'm really nothing. It doesn't add up to anything. You see, love is that which is best empowering every single thing that's good. Every single possession that we have is meaningless as far as gifts go unless there's love behind it. He goes on and then he reads this great description of love and we don't have time to spend all day on it. We could spend probably a whole sermon on each one of these qualities. But suffice it to say this, that when he describes what love is, you'll understand that it, he describes it as encompassing and including and indeed being that which is every virtue, every good thing. Everything is done only through love. And so listen to these and think about that as we just go through the list quickly. He says love suffers long. It's patient. It's a virtue. It's not envious. It doesn't desire what someone else has. It's not covetous. It vaunteth not itself. It doesn't try to push itself forward so our pride is elevated. It's humble. It doesn't behave itself unseemly, either in its own or in front of other people. In other words, it's pure. Pure. It doesn't seek its own. It's not easily provoked. It's meek. It thinks no evil. It esteems others better than itself. It's rejoicing never in iniquity. It's saddened by every sin. Are we saddened by sin? Or do we take pleasure in it? It rejoices, rejoices always in the truth. It's uplifted by truth. That's what holds it up. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. It's rich in faith. It's rich in hope. It's steadfast, enduring all things, it says. It lasts forever. It's steadfast. Charity never fails, the apostle says in closing. It never fails. It's as though their tongues are going to cease. Whether there's knowledge, it'll vanish away. All these things will be gone one day when we're in God's presence. They won't linger. They'll be gone, just like this life. But love will still exist. It's the sum of all things. It upholds everything. It's the bond of perfectness. It's that which we really need more than anything else. In another place, the Apostle Paul says that the fruit of the Spirit, and the first one he names is love. When we dwell with God, and God dwells in us, and we allow him to have his perfect work in us. That work is love. That work is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And it pours forth abundantly in every single act, every single thought, everything. And it's made perfect because of this love that powers us. Truly, it's God's love, but it becomes our love when we embrace God. The Lord said in John 15, he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so our love's reflected by what we do. But don't forget, keeping the commandments. Jesus said if we have evil in our heart, we violated the commandment of adultery, for example. And so it is that God wants this love of ours to percolate through our very souls, to cleanse us, to empower us, to make those gifts that God has for us actuated, empowered, and lively. God truly gives us this love as a divine quality. And when it exists in us, it brings us really to the heavenly life even while we're in this temporal life. It makes us dwell at peace with our brothers and our sisters in the world, yes, but I think even more so in the church, where God wants this bond of perfectness to be perfect and to be displayed and upheld to the entire world. 
Even more so, he wants us to show this love to our brothers and sisters in Christ and the church. May God increase our desire for this more excellent way so that we can be truly citizens of heaven and use the gifts. And I just wanted to read in closing a little passage from St. John Chrysostom, which was kind of his summation of this chapter in his commentary. He says this, Since then love is the artificer of all virtue, let us with all exactness implant her in our own souls, that she may produce for us many blessings, and that we may have her fruit continually abounding, the fruit which is ever fresh and never decays. For thus shall we obtain no less than eternal blessings, which may we all obtain through the grace and the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, with whom to the Father and also to the Holy Ghost be glory, power, and honor, now and forever, world without end. Amen.